there's a finite amount of money available left in the American house. At least we're talking about the United States. There's a finite amount of money left, yeah. and there's a very marginal amount of money that's possible for them, to, the average family, to get more. So you've maxed them out in terms of car prices. So there's no aspiration to like, I'm gonna make 20,000 more next year so I can go up to the next level because the next level is already too expensive for a car. So once you max out the family with these massive car payments or a massive like investment, there's nowhere for them to go. And when they go to flip the car, there's nowhere to go but upside down. So as a car brand and a car maker, you can't, you can't look at the typical three to five year life cycle anymore. So Mark and I are young bucks in this space. We've been doing this together for what, four and a half years, five years, just the two of us dealing with this stuff. You've been doing this for 40 years. Wow, man, he starts. Yeah, there you go. Starts in wow. Yep. Um, so he's, he's done calling you old, so he starts calling me old. Yeah. Uh, you You're know, the elder statesman time, here. His time will come. Very quickly, um, quicker, quicker than he cares to admit. Yep. The, this, this, the joke that Mark and I have all the time is we're fairly, I like to say realistic, other people like to call it cynical, and there's an element of doing this where it's not necessarily hard to get too excited, but it's hard to keep things in perspective. Mm -hmm. You've driven everything, and you've been doing this way longer than Mark and I have, and you've had more automotive experiences because of your time in this. How do you stay excited and grounded doing this? That is a function of understanding what your role is. So when I first got into this, what I thought is I thought I was supposed to tell people what I'm experiencing, but it always had to have some humor involved into it because my background is I'm a stand-up comic. But then I realized, you know, that, that's not really what I'm doing here. What I'm doing here is I'm developing a relationship with the audience and I'm giving them perspective on something they might not initially have access to, but, they, but over time will. So I realized, you know what, this is, it's storytelling, but you gotta be honest, even when it's hard. And you know this, working with car manufacturers, they don't like it when you're honest. It's there not are why they some that cars. do. Yeah, if, if you're not honest, sometimes they, they just don't like it. Like, you know, I'll flat out say it, Ford, if you don't say nice things about their car, you don't get your car anymore. Um, but there are others that are not like that. And they realize that if you balance the, the storytelling, where you, you're honest, hey, this doesn't work, but this does, that's respectful. Mark, for you then, I mean, you and I have this discussion all the time. How do you manage to keep perspective on some of the cars we drive? Like, you, you and I talk about this. You know, as much as I love doing the big documentary style films like GT3 RSs or, Z, or NSX, like the cars that are almost more important are regular cars, cheap regular cars. How do you keep perspective of what a cheap regular car should be for the amount of money? That's driven by feedback, mostly. Uh, as, as George knows as well, once you go up the tier of personal ownership of cars and you drive everything, you become slightly removed from the reality of what normal people are going through to a certain extent with cars. Um, you go and tell somebody, oh, I'm going to go buy an 80, 100,000 plus dollar car and it's like first world problems. So I, I really look to the guidance of a lot of the feedback and I go digging through feedback of other people's videos and internet to really get a, a feel for clearly something I know how difficult it is to afford a car, but also getting the feedback on our own videos. If I see constantly where you go on a, a bender of Porsches and expensive cars, people just start, don't like it. People don't like anything to begin with, but in general, the honest feedback is you're detached from reality. And I don't like seeing that. So I really try to connect back to what is important to the normal person and then trying to do the best job I can on the regular cars and put myself in the position of, am I this person? Spending $30,000 is a big ask, a huge cho choice in my life, and I take it just as seriously if, if I was buying a car. That's the only way it keeps me grounded. Mark and I have a, like basically, we've maybe caught one and a half development cycles of cars in our career doing this, right? Development cycles, three to five years, depending on the vehicle. We've been doing this together for five years. We've maybe seen two generations of car go from being currently developed to getting sold to the next one coming out. How long have you been doing this for? So the show was officially born in 2009. The first episode went live in 2010. But what's happened is the pace of change is way faster now than it was even 10 years ago. What do you mean and by that? So the Silverado EV. 
that came out, that platform was developed in 18 months. That didn't happen 10 years ago. We all have warped perspectives on how cars drive because we've been in so many of them. You've been in far more than we have. We're in like 500 cars or more yeah. in the last couple of years. You've been doing this for 14 years. You've probably driven over a thousand vehicles. Mm. How do you keep perspective and how has what you prioritize in a driving experience changed? When I first started, I felt like I needed to share this like very technical, almost like bullet points. As I'm driving the car, I'm like, well, it's got this kind of suspension, it's, this is the size of the brakes, and this is the feel I get from the brakes. And I felt like I was, I was rambling on too much. There was no story. I wasn't sharing any emotion. Now I get to the point, there's a friend, good friend of mine, his name is Brian. And when I'm sitting in that car, the thing I'm thinking about is, how would I describe this to my friend Brian? And that helps me keep my perspective of if I'm sitting behind the wheel of a Tacoma or if I'm sitting behind the wheel of an Elantra or if I'm sitting behind the wheel of a 992 ST, Brian, there's a different Brian for each one of those cars. So I want to share that experience that I'm lucky enough to be in that seat. How was your perspective on what a good car is changed? Or has it not changed? Are your guiding principles from 2010 the this, same as 2014? No, it actually has changed, and this is where it ties into our previous discussion. To me, and I, I really, this is almost counterintuitive being a car guy, how much are you asking me to write a check for this car for? And that drives a lot of my decision. Is that how you are too? Sometimes, yeah. I, I, not always. Because it's hard, you can't do that with normal cars. It's, your priorities are so vastly different. Somebody's not looking at a car of how much I'm writing a check for sometimes. You know, so it's like you gotta weigh, if it's my money, clearly my money and your money is worth different, is, worth, is different than somebody that's coming in and buying a Chevy Equinox. Has your expectation changed for what's good from five years ago to today? Uh, I started doing this in 2015. Um, I think my perception has changed quite a bit, yeah. Definitely. Has your perception changed of what's good and what's not? I feel like everything is overpriced. I feel like a lot of these car manufacturers, they have the balls to charge, say that the average car is $50,000. I think that's totally a bridge too far. In many ways, I don't entirely, I, I don't disagree. We have the, we literally, it's the conversation Mark and I have off camera all the time. You're like, shit's really expensive. I'm like, with inflation, if you look at a car price from 20, 2005 to today, in some elements, cars are cheaper than they used to be, but at the same time, that actual number amount you're paying for is astronomical. The average price of, the, of a car today in relation to the average income, income is way more expensive. Yes. It takes up, I did, so I do, uh, part of what I do is I do these speaking engagements. And uh, a lot of what people ask me to do is to talk about the car industry and where it intersects with business and where it intersects with the, with the economy. And so I have this slide, I can share it with you, where I take a Caprice, a Chevy Caprice, start back in 1977 and I go all the way to the last one they ever made. This becomes a different conversation, you know, the, the great divide, I can't remember what the, the New York Times expression for it was, but the wage gap between middle class people and wealthy yeah. people is so astronomical. So while well, the worth of money is X, the actual wage, wage stagnation makes it a difficult conversation. Yeah. I don't know how you guys feel, and this is a question I'll pose to you. I, I feel like certain brands shouldn't exist anymore. I feel like, like Lincoln is a great example. Okay, they're putting out a better product. Navigator is a good thing. Aviga uh, Aviator is a good thing. But if you were hard, if I told you, you couldn't lease that car. There was no subvented lease, meaning a discounted lease and you had to pay $80,000 for an Aviator, you mean to tell me you're gonna take an Aviator over a BMW X7 or a GLS? No. And I think anybody in that same position, not just you and I, would say the same thing. Oh, it's gonna, I think the, the industry's gonna shrink. With, oh, no doubt. With EVs, with the way cars are getting expensive, there are brands that are no longer going to exist. I'm, I don't, again, have a crystal ball in telling you what those brands are going to be, but I'm sure you have your own thoughts on that. Here's the good news. Instead of us being a bunch of negative Nancys, the good news is cars are better than they've ever been. And you have so much more choice than we've ever had, which makes the vehicles like a Lincoln Aviator, which is not a horrible vehicle. It's just yeah. they want $80,000 for it in a hybrid, and you can't tell me that it's as good as a GLS. Yeah. 
Well, I, I would argue two things with that is there's a finite amount of money available left in the American house. At least we're talking about the United States. There's a finite amount, amount of money left yeah. and there's a very marginal amount of money that's possible for them, to, the net average family to get more. So you've maxed them out in terms of car prices. So there's no aspiration to like, I'm gonna make 20,000 more next year so I can go up to the next level because the next level is already too expensive for a car. So once you max out the family with these massive car payments or a massive like investment, there's nowhere for them to go. Mm. And when they go to flip the car, there's nowhere to go but upside down. Mm. So as a car brand and a car maker, you can't you can't look at the typical three to five year life cycle anymore. You can like, oh, people are going to upgrade their cars every three years. It's impossible unless you do a lease, mm -hmm. and then that's our previous discussion. There, there's nowhere for American families to go when cars are so expensive. So the long term outlook of constantly flipping cars is not a long term thing that they they can sustain. Mm -hmm. The the last part of the the argument is, and you said cars are better. And I think if you look at a lot of the modern cars, namely in the hybrid space or EV space, they are not able to be replaced or fixed in our current environment. So not only are you selling a very overpriced car, you're selling a car that cannot be fixed long term by the average person of spending money outside of warranty, which means you have a whole bunch of disposable goods that are sitting on the market that people couldn't in good conscience buy. And it's a place we've never been before in mm -hmm. this industry. Um, and why I think it, it really needs to explode. And you said something about GM, uh, they have to, you know, they're trying to be, a lot of these brands are trying to be the first, right? If you're not the first, you don't want to be last. And what it's done is it's created a whole bunch of technology that is there for the sake of it. That's not innovative. It's just technology for the sake. It's also driving up the price. Mm -hmm. So the brands I think that are going to be left are those that have a really good grounded grip and reality of keeping keeping costs down while keeping things a little bit more simple. Um, and those are the, the brands that are gonna stick around through the wave of people not having enough money to buy cars. And that's kind of my fee feeling of it. So turning it around to you, you asked me what kind of, how do I stay excited? You guys now are doing this full time. You've been at this, you said, eight years doing this? Yes. Eight yeah. years and five years for you. Where do you see your business going? That's, in the next five years. Well, our priority, as many of you guys who watch us know, is the, the engineering storytelling for OEMs. I mean, at least the, the stuff that you guys see us put out is the working with engineers at the big brands to tell the story about how they develop something. Right? That's our niche. That's what we're good at doing. And I think that's what I find value in at this point. The car is secondary now to the people. I think the people story, I love cars obviously, but I think the people story and the hows and whys behind how something comes together is more interesting to me than in many ways the product itself. Do you still see yourself featuring all sorts of cars, commodity cars and the special cars, or do you see something changing over the years for you guys? The companies that do cars the best, or cons consumer cars the best, are, are car brands that shuffle engineers around. Like the, the thing that hurts GM in some ways is their best engineers are in Corvette and Camaro and truck. Their commodity cars don't really typically have their most senior best engineers and the American brands are really guilty of that. Um, the Japanese brands and the German brands in many ways, they move people around. So the engineering challenges associated with most cars are the same. So that story is always gonna be interesting. So I, like we did a pilot thing a little while ago where I interviewed the engineers. That to me was almost every bit as interesting as hearing about the new Mustang story from back in the day. I never forget, I went on a Hyundai, it was the Hyundai Sonata, totally new car in 2011. And I got invited to the drive, I wasn't particularly excited about it. And then I go to the drive and I saw this guy holding up the wall in one corner. No one was talking to him. And what you guys don't know behind the scenes, a lot of these journalists, they go for the top shelf liquor in the fancy hotel. We're there to drive the cars. And I'm going, I wanna see who this guy is, because he had the Hyundai badge on. Turns out he was the chief designer of Hyundai North America. And I hit it off with him. Long and short of the story, just by going and talking to him, he invited me to be embedded at his design studio to build a concept car from start to finish that became the Detroit Auto Show concept car for 2011. And that's when I realized the thing that gets me excited is not the cars, it's the people behind the cars. I think we share that same philosophy and that's probably why this is going to be a great fit going forward. If you invest in some of my vacation homes and you put down <laughs> the money right down today, we can... <laughs> okay, so that means we're at the point of the, of the episode where we turn it around to you guys, and I'm going to come up with a question this time. Yeah. What would you guys like to see both 
Savage Geese and Moto Man TV do for future episodes in their respective shows? Let us know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV Onward, Moto Man TV Onward, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Of course, these men, they will probably weigh in in the comments. Most likely, they will argue with you. This one probably argue with you more. Uh, if you found this interesting, I highly suggest you see our members only playlist where I talk to illustrious luminaries like these gentlemen in the industry and we uh, we basically solve all the world's problems. Right. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yep. Well, thank you gentlemen for yeah, having me here in you. your home show. Of Until course. we see you in the next episode. Peace. Thank you, sir. How many miles are you at now on the GT? 2,000. Oh, so you're actually... Yeah, I just literally this weekend, I haven't driven the car in a month, um, and it's been raining so much, so I haven't taken the car out. And then uh, they did, Porsche Santa Clara does this amazing cruise in every month. And it's like 1,000 cars. They have a, the museum downstairs. They have a restaurant in the place. So a bunch of us made the trek up from the South Bay and then after that, we kind of drove the canyons, went to a couple cigar lounges. I had a really good time. Really enjoyed it. And then got her back into the barn right before it started raining. Oh, nice. Yeah. Super fun. What are you daily in? Whatever press car you're Whatever press car I'm driving, yeah. Yeah, if you had his GT3, you would never go sideways on it. Uh, I would. You I would? Tell you, on the would. street? Oh, I yeah. would. I don't. I don't drive very fast on the freeway. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I, don't, I park it. I don't, I don't like, take it for, for like, Going to a grocery store, I wouldn't take it there. Yeah, yeah. It's rare that I take it to a place in the parking lot. I get that. I get really nervous. About I do get that. I do. Where they give me a five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars Rolls Royce, I'm like, go to another burger. Right. You know? Well, you're gonna do the stuff that you don't, you know, you can do and yeah. not have any stress about it. Yeah. I'm with you on that element of it, but as far as like driving it hard, I paid a lot of money. I'm gonna go to the track. I eight tenths, nine tenths. And I, like I know when I'm driving. So you're gonna track it. You're gonna track it. I track my car all the time. Wow. Yeah. The whole. Re Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it. I think if my car were less rare, I probably would track it. Because I did when I had an Elise. It's hard for me, man. Like, if I want to blow all this money on a car, I want to drive it. Like I said, not putting a lot of miles on it, but like if I'm going to, yeah. I'll point at that car, it's 9,000 RPM. After 1,000 miles. Yeah. 9,000 9, RPM.